I think I may as well just start off. Would any of you here for Gary Jones' session? Yes, if only he just don't keep me here. <laughs> we've saved ourselves a lot of like a bit of low impact. You see research. That's research for you. Um, I'm delighted you could come. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Tom Ben and I started and run Research Ed, of which you are, are a part of one of its many tentacles here here today. And thank you for coming. The reason I say thank you is because A, I'm always grateful for somebody who wants to come listen to you speak, quite frankly. Um, in this session, I want to talk about what research is, research ed is, how it came about. But more importantly than that, because it's, this isn't meant to be a vanity project, more importantly, what I think it means for the teaching profession and ramifications for the future of teaching, um, which I think is far, far more interesting than what happened to me on my holidays, as it were. However, I will tell you what happened to me on my holidays. Um, I am a classroom teacher, still. I'm, I'm hanging on by my fingernails. I do one day a week, right now, so, so I'm, I'm still giving a call myself a classroom teacher. But I went part-time two years ago to run this, this bad boy, uh, Research Head. Um, it came about because I had some very bad and bitter experiences with research very early on in my, in my teaching career. I'm, I'm very angry with research in many ways. It sounds like therapy, doesn't it? I'm very angry with my father. I'm very angry with research. Um, I'm not angry with my father. Just for a video, I love my father very dearly. Um, you always get so subconscious when you film. I wrote a book about six years ago called Teacher Proof, and it was really my kind of reaction against some of the guff that I've been exposed to in my early career as a teacher. You know, but bear in mind, my background is not research. You know, I am not a scientist. I'm not an academic in, in any shape or form. And my degree is in uh, philosophy, which is to say I'm unemployable <laughs> for many, many years, which is why I ended up running nightclubs in Seoul for 10 years. You, know, you can see the link beautifully, just as much as the link into teaching religious studies and philosophy later on. Um, so my, my experience is, is just that, it's experiential. And I remember I did a, I did a teaching fellowship at, at Cambridge several years ago. And it, you went there for a term, and you basically wrote something structured about teaching and so on. And I, I spent about three weeks there feeling like the biggest fraud in the world, thinking, what on earth have I got to add to this enormous, vast reservoir of information and knowledge and understanding in education? If you've ever been to the University of Cambridge's Faculty of Education and their library, it's like the last scene of Indiana Jones, which is, well, you know, room after room, but everything's covered in dust. And that's, and so that's not a comment on their housekeeping. <laughs> that's how often journals get looked at. Yeah. And that was something that I thought, that's odd. And then my mentor on that project said to me, well, look, you're a teacher, write like a teacher. Don't pretend to be a researcher. I thought, that's brilliant. So I wrote this book called Teacher Proof, a very angry book. And I was railing against lots of the current fans and fashions, things like brain gym and learning styles and so on. I really enjoyed writing the book. It's not the book I would write now, because it's a little bit raw, it's a little bit angry, and it's not um, focused enough. But it was, it was a, I think it was, for me it was, a good, it was a good introduction to, oh my God, there's so much terrible research in classrooms. Some of it's not even research, some of it claims to be research. Some of it's not even come from a university, some of it's come from a think tank, or a, or a, a pressure group but a commercial organisation, mm. often quite, quite a routine thing we see in tech claims, for example, that comes from commercial organisations. And I realised that if you were a teacher in a school, you would be exposed to hundreds and hundreds of claims every single day, let alone throughout your career, which would be substantiated more or less on claims of research, which themselves would have greater or lesser degrees of substantiation. And that really surprised and shocked me. When I came into teaching in 2003, I think it was, um, I kind of assumed that teaching would be a heavily evidence-based profession, that, that you know, people would have done lots of study and lots of structured work in how we teach, and that we would have pretty much answered all the questions by now. That's a very simplistic way of looking at it. But, you know, but I would have thought that would be the case. And what I didn't realize was that it was absolutely at the mercy of any claim that was possible. It's kind of like medicine in the 17th century. You know, if somebody wanted to say that you know, miasma caused infections, if somebody wanted to say that four humours meant that you had to have your blood let and so on, then they could say it. And if somebody said why, they would just say, I refer you to, you know, Hippocrates or something like that. You know, I refer you to a Greek text. 
And that's kind of where we are in teaching a little bit. We're kind of naked, we're kind of exposed, we're kind of, you can see almost anything. So I started to search it. I call it a polite revolution because, because I think it is quite, it's part of a greater movement which is quite profound and quite interesting. Um, in 2013 I was having a tweet conversation, because I don't actually leave my house anymore. This is pretty much the only time I appear. Um, so I'm a bit scared, so please don't shout at me. Um, I was having a conversation with Ben Goldacre, if you know him, the kind of bad science guru, and, and Sam, Sam Friedman, who, who was DFE advisor at the time. And he basically said, well, if you care so much about research and education, why don't you start a bloody conference? So I, I was sitting on the sofa, I think I was watching, oh my God, what's that terrible film? G.I. Joe. <laughs> G.I. Joe, you know, I mean, normally I just watch, you know, movies with subtitles and so on. But that night I was watching G.I. Joe <laughs> for a project. And, and I tweeted it, I said, does anyone want to help me put together a conference? And boom, three o'clock that morning. I was still answering tweets and emails. That's significant. That wasn't down to me. That was down to people being engaged with this kind of thing. People wanted to speak, people wanted to host, people wanted to fund, people wanted to hand out flowers in the day. So we did a conference. It sold out really, really quickly. We had some terrific speakers. It was going to be a one-off project. People said, we want to do this again. I think that's when I suspected this was more than just, wouldn't it be fun to all get together? The first conference was the majority of people there were teachers. And that was significant. You know, you're here on a Saturday. Some of you will be teachers, I'm presuming, or, or school leaders, or working in schools. Some of you will not. Some of you will be working in, pardon me, you know, support organisations or intermediate organisations. Some of you will be working in academia and research and so on. But the most of the people there were teachers, and that's significant. I remember speaking to um, one of the one of the people in the Faculty of Education at King's College London, and they said, I met them for the first time, and they said, Ah, Tom, I hate you. <laughs> I said, well, why do you hate me? He said, because I've been trying for 25 years to get teachers into, into research. And again, this wasn't me, this was just catalyzed by an appetite that was existing there already. So we did Birmingham, we did York, we did another one in London, we launched a website. It started to go a bit nuts, but then I'm still running this on my kitchen table at 3 o'clock in the morning, every night after I've been going to bed. I've got a child of six months old at this point, so as you can imagine, life is peaceful. Um, <laughs> I'm actually 25 years old, look at what happened to me. Um, we did 2014, we did uh, 2015, we did another one, 1,000 people came this time. Uh, we, we, last year we went to Sydney, New York, Scotland, or Europe as we now call it. Um, we did one on the we did two in literacy, yada, yada, yada. It just it went kind of nuts in 2015. And yeah, it was a lot to run, I've got to be honest. So I went part time then. And in 2016, we're doing Melbourne, Amsterdam, Sweden, rugby, obviously the jewel in the crown, as I said. Swindon. Have you been to Swindon? Yeah. It's lovely. It's lovely. Cricket and a taxi. Uh, York, again. Uh, Somerset, London. Somerset was an interesting one. Somerset's a bit like rugby. It was a, a badged conference in the sense that people came to, uh, people have started to come to me saying, can we run a research at conference? <coughs> um, and obviously with kind of distance curation and making sure they're involved and I give them a template and you know no money passes hands it's all it's all pro bono um, and so that's why I'm really impressed with what Jude and Steve are putting together here today this is a great this is a great little day and it's dirt cheap isn't it and if you're interested in developing your profession developing yourself as a teacher or as an educator in any form what a great way of doing it what a great way of doing it I, I realized there was something very powerful in this model which was you have it on a Saturday which means if you're coming, you've got to want to come. Mm -hmm. right? Now, there's no perfect day to put a conference on, because Saturdays are special days for other people. I was once told, I had an interesting conversation with a Jewish gentleman in New York, and he absolutely made the right point that, of course, if you're an Orthodox Jew, Saturdays are very difficult to come to as well. So, you know, it, 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 there's a tension. There's always going to be an issue there. But Saturday was the, the, the best fit, and it was certainly a lot better than Mondays to Fridays, because, of course, then you're relying on the demographic of people who are allowed to leave school to do it. Now, you can still get lots of people that way. If any of you went to the Festival of Education over the past couple of days, they had two, three thousand people there. About half of which, I think, are you know, full-time educators. So, you can get teachers out, but it's a better bet to do it on a Saturday. Because then they're doing it for themselves. Then they want to be there. You keep the costs as low as possible. This isn't about profit. God forbid. You know, this isn't another 
um, I, won't name, I won't name them now because we're on camera now, but this isn't another blank. We want to um, support and help people within the educational research community. That's all we want to do. Um, we make sure that when we get funding, it's up. We rely on back-end funding rather than front-end funding. So the ticket prices are always as low as possible. And then we get a bit of money from Teach First, and a bit of money from you know, the Tez, and a bit of money from our union here. And so, so we do our best to just fund it that way. And we work on a zero capital basis. So we, we end up with almost nothing at the end of each conference. Which is, uh, which is essentially like a year-round coronary for me. Um, but there we go. It's great fun though. So we're going to uh, Washington in October, I can't wait. If I'm honest, I just pick places I really want to go to now, <laughs> as you can see about me. Um, the main aim is to raise research literacy of the teaching communities. Not to make everyone a researcher. To raise research literacy as much as possible. <coughs> How do you do that? My first thought was, let's just talk about it as much as possible. And I think those of you who are engaged with online, Educational communities. I mean, I, I'm never off Twitter. I'm, 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 I'm tempted to tweet right now, just <laughs> while speaking to you. Um, you. There's some great conversations going on, and people recommending papers to read, and people having really interesting, albeit fairly pithy, debates about educational research. Sometimes the the haiku of Twitter is not the best way to discuss nuanced, you know, granular, granular discussions. Um, but it's a good start, and you can make links with people that you would never normally meet and engage with. I remember my first experience of using online communities as a kind of transformative experience. I was writing a book, I'm writing a children's book, would you believe, because I don't you know, have enough things to do with my life. And I wanted a Latin translation. And I tweeted something on Twitter, I said, does anyone know anyone that can do a good Latin translation? Obviously, Boris Johnson wasn't online at that point. And, and somebody said, have you tried, you know, at Mary Beard, Oxford.com, or whatever, you know, I don't know what. And I said, you know, I was like, oh, don't be daft. That's Mary Beard. 30 minutes later, Mary Beard pops up. Hi, how can I help you? <laughs> I'm like, shouldn't you be presenting something on BBC4? Um, and I said, can you translate this phrase, um, we fall to rise or something? And she says, what period of Latin would you like? To <laughs> I said, I haven't really thought that far. <laughs> it's a children's book, does it matter? So, you know, that's the kind of thing that can happen. When we did research in Sydney, and Melbourne, we trended in the UK on Twitter. For those of you that are not on Twitter, that just basically means it's, it's one of the ten most talked about topics. So in the UK, people were talking about what was being discussed in research in Sydney. Once the time gap had cut up, like seven hours later, and I was dying of jet lag, when people started to wake up and wanted to talk about it. Now, on one level, that's meaningless. Who cares, you know, you're trending on Twitter, big deal. It sounds like the sort of thing that, you know, the cast of Made in Chelsea would, would care a lot about. On another level, it's actually quite profound because it suggests that when a small number of people talk about the same thing and they're all pushing in the same direction, you can actually have quite a large impact. Um, to give an example, we are, for those of you who care, we are trending on Twitter right now. Top, we're number 10. We just made it. We just made it. Even though the, the hashtag is about 400 characters long. Red rug, I'm telling you, that's what it should be. Um, so I want to raise research as the same as much as possible. Gary made some good points here in his session earlier the on. There's two ways you can approach this. You either make sure that teachers are trained in and are using methods and techniques which are as substantiated as possible by research. Although the teachers themselves may not be aware of that. But then to be fair, and that's okay actually to some extent, because when I you know, turn on my mobile phone, I don't know the science that informs it. But as long as I know that it's working, I'm happy that somebody who's an expert in mobile phones has passed this, this thing on to me and uh, allowed it to work. That's not good enough by itself though. I wouldn't like teachers to be dislocated from research and not understand why the research works. But I'll, I'll be happy with that. I'll be happy if teachers are doing things which are research substantiated, mm. even if they don't know about it, rather than doing things which aren't research substantiated and they don't know anything about it and why. Mm. So for example, in my first two years of teaching, I did, I did brain gym. You've done brain gym, right? Some of you, some of you who have been in the profession for more than five years know exactly what I'm talking about here. Brain gym, the science of learning. You rub your brain buttons to improve your cognitive ability. Probably you've got brain buttons here, under your collarbone, who knew? Who knew? 
I've got bruises to prove it. <laughs> Nothing's working yet. Um, you know, my favourite part of brain gym was the fact that you were supposed to drink water during thinking activities, which sounds reasonably intuitively pro probable that you should try and stay hydrated as an organism. <laughs> that makes sense. But you were supposed to hold it to the top of your mouth using your tongue, because that was the quickest way to your brain. You know? This is the kind of this is the kind of stuff you'd be burned at the stake as a witch 400 years ago, and yet in schools, come on in. At what at, at the best, it's just a waste of time, and at the worst, it's it's dissolving. It's dissolving our profession. It's dissolving our professional ability to be critical of what it is and what we do and why we're doing it. If you just say, okay, that sounds good, then you might as well just put your thinking hat on and get to the brain gym. I saw a wonderful thing, if I've got a minute I might show you. I, I played this at research at Oxford a few weeks ago. David Lloyd, who I've no doubt are a perfectly fantastic organisation, um, were selling something called Reviser Size. Has anyone seen Reviser Size? Let that, let that be your homework. That's the takeaway. Go home and look up Reviser Size David Lloyd. There's a five minute clip. And during exam season they were selling exercises, and I mean physical exercises, that were tailored to different subjects. So that when you are doing your kickbox, you would do Battle of Hastings, 1066, bang! And it would partly meant to embed the knowledge more clearly in your mind. I love that. I love that. Even though there's loads of re genuine research which shows that when you are doing hard physical labour, your cognitive ability is, is obviously to some extent impaired. You can't do the kind of decision making things when you're sweating your guts out, revise your size. But stuff like that gets into school. And people get to sell it a lot. People buy it a lot. And why? Well, that's a complex question. But part of the reason is that within the ecosystem of a school, we're often asked to produce results. We're not asked, we're told to produce certain results. Now, those results can only happen as the, as the result of long and complex interactions with pupils. So if you can say to someone, here, I have a very simple magic bullet answer to your complex social scenario. All you have to do is essentially press, press this magic buy me button. <coughs> and that will solve all your problems. The people have been selling snake oil for centuries, but we're still buying it in schools. I'd love to create a research community, sorry, a teaching community of educators, from school leaders to teaching assistants, everything in between, who were research literate enough to develop what I call a kind of herd immunity. So I don't mean every teacher and every educator has to become a researcher. We don't have time. And any, any consideration of change within the profession, which doesn't take into account how busy we all bloody well are, is doomed to fail you, right? So you have to take this into account. But there are enough people like you, you chosen few, really going to come as you call it speech now, but you chosen few, who care enough and have got the inclination, and let's not forget, we do often, we make time for the things we care about, don't we? You know, you do, you stay up late to watch the movie you love. You'll come out on a Saturday to listen to somebody throwing on about RCTs, if you think it matters, you know? Um, yeah, that sense of herd immunity, I think that's something I'd love to help achieve. So there's enough people in schools to go, hang about, I'm sure I read something by, who are, you know, Frank Cornelis, and Daniel Willingham, and Terry Hayden, or whatever. <laughs> Who's the same guy? Um, I like to create more relationships between people within this, what I call the ecosystem. I've, I've spoken to people in some very profound and influential research organisations who said, why do we need to talk to teachers? This, this is people involved in educational research. Why do we need to talk to teachers? Now, on one level I understand because I, I, I believe that knowledge should be pursued for its own sake. You know, I believe that you, know, you, you should just try and study things which don't have any immediate outcome. That's absolutely true. But to but to decry any engagement at all with the people who are meant to be the, you know, the chief participants in the outputs of your research, I think is a little bit weird. And that attitude is, is existent, sadly, and not universally, but too much. And I want teachers to speak to researchers more, so that researchers understand more about the needs of what teachers are looking for, which may or may not influence what they do, but also so that teachers understand more about the methodology of researchers. One of the things I'd love to see is to see uh, all teachers given a very small but powerful training 
in some basic techniques of research methodology and reading a research paper at the start of their career. Why is that? Why? But why though? Because I've had teachers, very good teachers, saying to me, I've never read a drop of research in my life. I'm a good teacher. Absolutely correct, of course. Do you need research? No, you don't. But that misses the point about the kind of ecosystem in which we inhabit. We now live in a world where you will routinely be pulled hither and thither. I love saying hither and thither. Pulled, pulled hither and thither by people who will claim that their decision has been research informed. Either a budget holder, a school leader, some involved in policy, some involved in local education authorities, some involved in your mat, whatever. Or worse, they make a decision and allude in no way to any kind of substantiated evidence. Can I just say, sorry, I beg your pardon, research is only one type of evidence. There's lots of other types of evidence which are just as powerful. Your personal experiences are evidence. And I'm sorry, I must reinforce that. It's just that your own personal experiences have got strengths and weaknesses in terms of how good the evidence is. The strength is that it's immediate and experiential. The weakness is that it might not be scalable or you may have misinterpreted it. Just as an RCT, a randomized controlled trial or something, has got its own strengths and weaknesses. An RCT is really good at big picture data, but it's very poor at granularizing and understanding the nuance of arguments and understanding individual things going on. Um, you know, if you read, for instance, the EEF um, and their work on the Teaching and Learning Toolkit, have you, has anyone seen the Teaching and Learning Toolkit? They're all converts. You know. Have you seen the graph? Nice, simple graph to do. Um, what is it? Impact of intervention versus cost. Yeah? And you get teaching assistants. Very expensive. Low impact. Now, that's, you know, that, that, that's what an RCD would tell you. And if, I would agree that actually there are also TAs that are being very improperly used that have a very low impact. But then I also know TAs who have changed lives. <laughs> yeah? And are worth more than the teacher in the classroom, worth more than me. So you have to take that into account. I've seen schools just get rid of their TAs. Why? Because the teaching and learning toolkit says so. Alright? So there are limitations to that kind of methodology too. But that's okay. The only danger is assuming that research proves that beyond any credible doubt and they're not allowed to challenge it and that every research is, is equal, every piece of research is equal and all evidence is equal. That's as bad as believing one of those shampoo adverts because somebody's got a white jacket on. You know, our toothpaste adverts are good for that, aren't they? You know, they show every picture of a molar and somebody with a jacket said, well, that's what happens. I love it. Um, and finally, to, to raise standards. So all this is to raise standards within, within our communities. So that, for example, the next time someone comes along and says to you, um, I want every child in the school to have bi-weekly homework. <laughs> I've been in a school where every child has to have bi-weekly homework. I'm talking secondary school here. Right? If you teach humanities, you've got 250 pupils. That's 500 pieces of homework to mark. Mm. Kill me now. <laughs> You, you want to talk about workload problems? You want to talk about retention problems? Sometimes we have to look at ourselves, but I'll digress, that's another, that's another topic. But I want teachers to stand up and say, where's your evidence for that? If someone comes along and says, I'm going to set or stream every child in this class, again, I don't know where you stand on setting or streaming and so on. And there's evidence to substantiate different views in different contexts. But when someone says we're going to do it in every classroom, ask them, okay, what are you basing that on? If it's just a hunch, I want people to say it's a hunch. I got a feeling as well. I'm not saying. But, I, but what I don't want them to say is, you know, it must be right. I want people in education to think, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? And their answer might be, because it's worked with all my pupils. And, and that, actually, I'm going to accept that as one, one valid stream of evidence. But it might not be something that's worked with all your pupils. Um, I probably don't have much time left because I don't know how, how much I rattle on. When does this finish? Do you have the time on? Oh, Thirteen minutes to go. Awesome. Great. <coughs> Forty-five slides left. I think we can get through it now. Um, I want us to be resistant. I'll just, this will be available, incidentally. What I normally do after each event is I put everything in a Dropbox. So if anyone's willing to contribute the slides, which many people are, we'll email it all out to you. Okay? Um, I want people to be resistant to fads and fashions. When the next brain gym comes around, I want people to... <coughs> I wanted to do that, essentially, but no shit, right? <laughs> uh, so, you know, next year's brain gym, I don't know what it is, probably mindfulness, that's this year, isn't it? 
Oh no, this year's brain gym is reception, I forgot. Mm -hmm. But yeah, absolutely, be critical of what we're doing here. You know, and I'm very keen to try and avoid bias as much as possible. This is not the Tom Bennett Road show, this is, this is greater than just what I think. You know, I am not a great researcher by any means. That's why I get people who know about research to come and talk about it. Um, I want people to engage with research that will assist what they want to do. It's almost certain that any issue or goal or aim that you have, somebody's done some kind of structured analysis of it. Good or bad. I want people to be able to understand the good from the bad. Uh, and this is my more political motive here, which I'm happy to expose to you. I am very interested in reprofessionalizing what is not professional right now. I don't think teachers are professional. I would, John David Blake, you know Doug John? The, 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 the flame haired enfant terrible of the, of the, the Labour Centre. He famously said that teaching is not a mature profession. I completely agree with that. It's a quasi profession at best. There's not an agreed body of knowledge which we can all share and substantiate and support. We are prone to fashions and fads. We have been harrowed of our autonomy and our agency by decades of top down prescriptivism. I often feel. I've often felt in my career, and I've often seen in many, many schools, many teachers are essentially delivery mechanisms. You know, give that to the children. Hire a postman if you want to do that. I'm, incidentally, I'm not against all prescriptivism. I think that you know, schools have got a perfect right to set goals and values and curriculums and syllabuses and all that stuff. I agree with all that. But for teachers to become better teachers, we have to have the confidence and the space and the, and the dignity to develop our practice by ourselves. And some of that comes down to developing our own CPD, because right now, the model of CPD which exists nationally in the UK is shocking. It's shocking. Well, I mean, I've been to CPDs where they've sold me brain gym and think enhance and all kinds of stuff. And this is about people getting paid thousands of pounds to come to school. Uh, most intents at school tend to be senior members of staff telling you what the school goals are for that year. A little bit of data to tell you who your achievement groups are to target, and a bit of all That you know, many schools do much better into it than that, but that's a very, very common cycle. That the whole Baker Day inset model, I think, needs to be exploded. Mm -hmm. One of the ways we're doing that is by having self-driven days like this. Mm -hmm. I'll be clear here. I'm not sure how much a deal is actually is CPD, other than in a informal sense. You know, we give you ideas and we we, we try and point in different directions, but it's not formal training. And I'm not going to try and oversell it. You know, Dylan Williams done some good work in this, and, and uh, the Teacher Development Trust has done some interesting research on what constitutes good CPD. And if you get a chance, read Teacher Development Trust on good CPD. And it's basically sustained programs, which over a period of time, this isn't sustained. You know, this is a come along and have a biscuit and a cuddle, and let's talk about research. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I lied, there are no cuddles, but there are biscuits. Um, so I see this as a kind of political enfranchisement of us as a profession. I now get teachers arguing online about, you know, the value of phonics and so on. And I, and I love the fact that teachers are now having discussions about this kind of thing. It's like, you know, it brings a tear to my eye and heart to see teachers engaging in this kind of stuff and actually trying to dig into the research a wee bit and talk to researchers and researchers are talking back with them and they're discussing the results and their findings. It's a brave new world that has such creatures in it. And I'm very, very proud to, to be part of it. I'm delighted that people yourselves to come along and be part of it. Because we've had about 4,000, 5,000 people now come in the UK to research and events for the past two years. That's, that's separate people. Um, in a profession of 500,000, that's 1%. <coughs> We're getting there. So give me another. <laughs> I, can't, I don't do maths. What, 50 years? Maybe we'll have over 50%. I don't know. A couple of things on the next So that's just what I'll be talking about. Um, other things you can do. Research leads in school. Have you heard of research leads? Something we talked about in the first column. Is anyone here a research lead? No. A research lead is basically somebody in school whose designated role is to engage with research and cascade into the school. There are Hundreds of different ways I've seen this happen. It can be the head teacher, it can be a TA, it can be a teacher, it can be an administrator. As long as it's somebody who's passionate about engagement, it's kind of stuff. It can be somebody who comes to research ed conferences and then goes back to school and says, maybe we should try this. It can be somebody who 
acts as a kind of a Salieri consigliere figure to the, <coughs> to the head teacher and says, have you thought of this approach? It can be somebody who comes in and talks about methodologies. It can be somebody who comes along and talks about COVID research, whatever. It's somebody who, the school whose job it is to bring research to the school because most teachers don't have time to do it. You can form a journal club, very popular in medicine. I know it's tiresome to constantly compare mm -hmm. medicine to education. They are not, you know, there's not a perfect overlap there. But a journal club is basically when you get four or five or six or seven teachers, educators, whoever, and they all get given something to read. It could be a book or an article or a piece of research, and then they come together to discuss it. It's like a book club, essentially. And they, and they unpick it and they unpack it and they interpret it through the lens of their own experiences. The, the, the aim isn't to come away with an answer, the aim is to come away with you know, discussion on it. Or somebody would recommend that. Um, I've kind of mentioned the model as well. We're not a net for profit. We bring together teachers, researchers, intermediaries, leaders, policy makers. We've got Nicola Morgan. Nicky Morgan, I mean, sorry. We've got Nicky Morgan coming in September to the national conference. Um, that is if she hasn't become. <laughs> I tell you what, though, it's a week before conference leadership election, so that'd be awesome. I'm praying, I'm praying that she throws her hat in and still comes to conference, because we'll have cameras coming out of the wazoo. Um, but it's, it's important for people in policy come along because it's important to discuss with them, you know, why are you engaged with research and are you engaged with research? There's a wonderful report, I think it... God, who's it by now? Oh, it's the C sorry, the CFBT did some research in 2003 and they basically went to every Secretary of State over the past 30 years who's still alive and said, how did you make your decisions when you were a, when you, when you were a minister? And, you know, the answers are probably unsurprising, but it's good to have it substantiated. One of the main reasons was personal experience. Another one of the reasons was experience of friends. Another one was values. Another one was budget requirements. Another one was uh, the length of tenure in office. There's loads and loads of pressures on a minister to make certain decisions. And way, way down, you know, reason number 562 was used research to substantiate. I went to uh, an education conference in Dubai a year and a half ago, and that was pretty mind blowing. Right? And, and there was, and Tony Blair was doing a doing a, doing a, a, an interview, and I just kind of blocked it out. I said, I've got a question. And uh, before MI6 could take me down, I said, "How much did research inform your your opinions of of, of, of education?" And he said, "There isn't any educational research that I could use." And I thought, "What's well, possibly not the case?" <laughs> right. So. We've just, sorry, we've just done Oxford University, I beg your pardon, I should have taken that slide out. Uh, London's coming up September the 10th, do come along if you want. It is an astonishingly busy but very, very satisfying day, your mind will pop. Um, you build a day for yourself, a bit like today, but instead of four or five sessions, there's like 15 different sessions going on. And we're so, so lucky, we get amazing names, people to come along and speak. Um, Washington, can anyone, can anyone make Washington? Yes, come along. <laughs> Bizarrely enough, we do get that. I'm going to be in Washington in October. You're kidding. No, I had no idea that you were... Oh my God, that's going to be big. Come along. Um, I tell you what, if you want to come, I'll give you a free ticket. Because that, that is just too bizarre, isn't it? Um, it's not actually going to be in the White House. <laughs> How good would that be? Although I'm, I've been invited to go to the White House, so I'm very pleased. Uh, and it's a week before the election there as well. So it won't be busy in Washington, I'm sure. <laughs> Fairly quiet. And um, the only reason I mention that is A, because I'm extremely proud of this, that we've managed to reach so far. We've been asked to do more gigs in America. We're going back to Australia next year to potentially do two, including New Zealand as well. Um, the, the what I now call the European movement has, is, is just burgeoning. We're doing uh, Amsterdam again. We're doing Norway and Sweden in the next uh, seven months and so. We've been invited to do Germany, South Africa, Hong Kong. It's just, it's gone bananas. It's a little polite revolution. And I haven't been able to work out how to make money out of it. Damn it. But I don't care. If we can just make it happen, that's all I care about. And we can get these conversations going. And it's great because I'm now getting speakers from UK conferences going over to speak at researchers in other countries and vice versa. We've even had some cross-fertilisation from the Australian 
contingents. It's just, it's, it's bizarre and it's brilliant and it's so, so positive and so beautiful to see teachers and educators and researchers coming together with a state of perfect humility of let's learn from each other. And I don't mean that in a kind of a tree hugging sense, I just, because I'm not a natural tree hugger, but I just think that's a lovely thing. You know, the altruism that exudes from it is so, is so, so great. I think it's a positive step. I think these are interesting times. Um, and through research and through me, I've helped to write a small strand of research literacy into the new ITT standards that are coming out. If that gets accepted, touches every piece of wood I possibly can, then that could be quite interesting as well. There might actually be uh, some kind of required component of research literacy in every new member of staff, so that teachers can at least be exposed to opportunities and challenges of different types of methodologies, exposed to critiques of subjects, rather than just your teacher trainer saying, you know, here's what Bygotsky said, that's that, and that therefore is the truth. I want teachers to be critical consumers of this kind of information. Um, yeah, that would be quite exciting. And also, some, and then some teachers will go and diversify in their career and become far more research literate, maybe do masters and so on, and that would be awesome too. Because I believe very much that, and sorry, this is a different topic, that the continuing professional development teachers should be, uh, should be a diversified career rather than the, the model linear you know, classroom teacher to the lofty heights of head and then you get your head chopped off. You know, that's, that's, that's not an attractive career path. But there's other things you could do. One of them could be to be, for instance, your research leader, well, some kind of research leader, practitioner. I have used up my time. One minute left. Um, does anyone want to use that minute with a question? <laughs> That's super awesome. You all get a minute off then. Mm -hmm. Guys, it's been a, a huge pleasure. Thank you so much for coming and listening to me. Um, go forth in research. I hope you have a, you know, a fruitful career. And get involved if you want to help out with research ed. If you want to come and hand out leaflets and put on a beautiful t-shirt, uh, or if you want to organise a conference yourself and get one of these fantastic silver pins, <laughs> yeah, you see the machine I'm making here? Um, you know, just get in touch. We've got loads of different models of how we do these things and how we fund them and how we put them together. I'll give you any help that I can. So thank you very much. Thank you.